For about 130 years, America has been the most powerful society in the entire world. And for about the last 70 years, we have seen the American economy be the flagship for the entire planet. However, in the last 15 years, we have started to finally see a decline in America's power. And the days of America being the most powerful society in the world could be coming to an end. By 2025, we are going to be at war. We are going to have a new dollar, a currency that probably is coming from the central bank. We'll have a currency collapse. We've got banks collapsing, US dollars under attack, looming recession. Well, there's a very real risk that the United States will lose its mantle as the world's superpower. I know that might sound crazy to a lot of people. It's not far off. The world is changing very rapidly, and the truth is, if you can prepare for the next big cycle bust, not only are you going to survive, but you are going to thrive during all of these changes that are going to happen. What I'm about to tell you has happened many times before and will likely happen many times in the future. It's a constant and perpetual cycle that so far does not have an end and has very few outliers. And you might be sitting there at your house or wherever you are watching this video thinking that America is too big to fail and that I'm just a stupid influencer and I do not know anything. I'm sure we'll figure it out because we do every single time and this guy is just being dramatic right? Well, I'm going to say that that's not necessarily the case. All you have to do is take a look back through time and you'll see so for yourself. If you look back to the British Empire prior to World War II, you would see that it was the global superpower for over a century. Yet after World War II, the British Empire nearly collapsed, lost reserve currency status, and virtually bankrupted themselves. A disaster that took many years to fix. But maybe the collapse of that empire when it was the global superpower was just an exception, right? Well, let's look back to the global superpower before Great Britain. Just like the British, for nearly 100 years, the Dutch Golden Age took over the world economy. From the late 1500s, Dutch trade, scientific advancement, and economic power skyrocketed until they were one of the most dominant countries on Earth. And of course, that was until their inevitable collapse in 1672. And what caused the collapse of the Dutch Golden Age? Costly wars such as the Franco-Dutch and the War of Spanish Secession fueled their economic downward spiral. And if you keep looking back, you will continue to see the trend of one society growing to power, becoming the most powerful, and then inevitably collapsing. And I'm also going to explain how I myself am going to prepare for these times and how I plan to survive through these times and even better, how I plan to thrive and come out on the other side even better than I ever was. Because this train is not stopping for anyone and there's only a matter of time until something crazy happens. Just like I mentioned before, the world moves in cycles. The exact same wealth disparity between the poor and the rich that we're experiencing today in America has happened many times before. And so has the possibility of wars and huge divisions between the right and the left wing political parties. It's written all over history and they come in cycles. And by taking a page out of billionaire hedge fund owner Ray Dalio's playbook, you can take advantage of these cycles so that you can survive and make it through these tough and turbulent times, but also come out even stronger just like I'm planning to. And throughout this video, I'm going to do my best to illustrate that picture for you. So let's begin by talking about world orders and their cycles. There's two cycles that determine the rise and fall of nations and have been proven to do so for hundreds of years. The first one is the long-term debt cycle. In the beginning of this cycle, debt levels are low and productivity is high. This means that people borrow money and invest, which creates more wealth, in turn leading to an increase in productivity. Standards of living rise and the country has an economic boom. And in a nutshell, life is great all around. But as everyone knows, all good things come to an end. When the country peaks economically and the standard of living gets better than ever before, its population naturally becomes lazy. The attitude of a country shifts and instead of working hard and finding new ways for innovation, people enjoy their life. They rest more, they take extra vacations, they based in the luxuries that they have worked so hard for. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. Everybody needs time to rest and enjoy a life that they work hard for. But we have to look at the facts. There's a reason that immigrant children often do so much better than people born in the United States. The grit and determination coming from a tough background is what inspires hard work and motivation for financial gain and escaping poverty. And this is something that I personally relate to and understand because of the childhood that I had when I grew up. And you don't have to trust me because all of the statistics prove it. Just look it up. As the society gets more 
more and more in debt, things naturally start to break. Businesses fail, people go bankrupt, and people are no longer able to borrow money as easily as they used to. As a result, the country becomes less innovative and slowly loses its power until high levels of debt cause financial crises and even wars. And after that, the cycle starts again and again and again. Within these large debt cycles, there are a bunch of very, very small debt cycles. So these large ones can last multiple decades long, and the short debt cycles typically last less than a decade long. Now, the second cycle is the cycle of internal order. This cycle looks at how people treat each other and their nation. Do they respect the law? Do they have care for each other? Do they work hard? When debts become too large, there's an economic downturn, and the empire can no longer borrow the money necessary from other countries to repay its debts, which forces one of two things. One, the country can either default on their debt, or two, the country can print more money. Now, I'll get into both of these a little bit further in the video, but all you need to know right now is that basically every single time, the country is going to opt for printing more money, which devalues their currency just a little bit and causes a little bit of inflation. And this is not some sort of myth. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that America printed trillions and trillions of dollars during the pandemic crisis that we went through the last couple of years. Some articles saying that they printed up to $13 trillion over the last three or four years. And it does not end there. According to Ray Dalio's book, Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order, it is at these times that the government has trouble funding itself. The ever-increasing wealth gaps cause internal conflict between the rich and the poor and different ethnic groups races and religions all grow further apart does any of that sound familiar to you <laughs> nearly 70 percent of all of america's wealth is owned by 10 percent of people and that gap is not getting any smaller just turn on the news and you'll see countless examples of racial political and religious hatred within the u.s we're living in these times right now and it does not end here during these times of internal chaos the huge divide between groups causes political extremism which manifests itself in a society as the left wanting to redistribute the money and the right wanting to maintain the wealth leading to an anti-capitalist movement and people blaming the elites in general for all of the problems in the nation does any of that sound familiar typically when this happens a country will raise Raise taxes and once the rich people feel that their wealth is going to be taken away they'll move it to other countries currencies and assets they deem safer reducing the country's tax revenue and leading to a classic reinforcing downward spiral if you're a man or a woman in america these things that i'm saying should feel eerily familiar although it hasn't seemed to gotten too crazy yet it's definitely on its way there now once the wealth leaving the country becomes too large the country will outlaw it making the rich people panic these turbulent times lead to a decrease in productivity Activity, shrinking the economic pie even further and causes more disagreements about how to divide the small amount of resources that is left. At this point, populist leaders might emerge from the crowds. They promise to take control of the country's situation, which is when democracy is at its most fragile state since it's failing to control the anarchy, meaning the move to a strong populist leader is most likely. If internal conflict continues to escalate, some form of revolution or civil war occurs to redistribute the money and resources, and it's usually ugly, violent, and very painful. This eventually changes the internal order of a society and a new cycle begins. Now, how do these two cycles that we just talked about fit into the big one, the big 500 year cycle? Which if you want to learn more about, you should definitely go and research after this video. But here's a graph of the big 500 year cycle. And as you can see, you have the rise, the top and the decline and we will have indicators that a society is at a certain point during this cycle so in the beginning we'll have strong leadership inventiveness education strong culture good resource allocation good competitiveness strong income growth strong markets and financial centers then once we get more compliant and once we get to the top we have less productivity we're overextended we're losing competitiveness we have wealth gaps and then as things start to go down we have large debts printing money, internal conflict, loss of reserve currency, weak leadership, and civil war slash revolution. I don't know if you live in America or not, but most of my channel does. And those last things that I just said to you should scare you because that is exactly what we are dealing with right now. The only exception is that we still have reserve currency status. And yes, we do have that, but we are devaluing that currency and weakening that currency at record pace. And I think the only case against us losing our reserve currency status is just the fact that so many other societies, especially big ones, are also completely destroying their currencies right now. And really the whole world is a mess. There's only a few countries that are 
doing really, really well, but they're all very small. If it's not obvious already, America is towards the end of their cycle. Inflation rates are rising and the US government is printing trillions of dollars every single year and they are not going to slow down. They are taking out record levels amount of debt. Right now, as I'm filming this, the interest payment on the government's debt is one of the biggest line items of expense out of their whole thing, which is insane. And as interest rates stay elevated for longer, if they do, this is only going to be much more painful for the government. I don't know, man, something is gonna have to give. This is all happening while the growing gap between the right and the left, the rich and the poor are growing exponentially. Like the right and the left, if, just think about it 10 years ago, it was so much different than what it is today. Like if you're on one side, you immediately hate people on the other side. And the wealth gap, I mean, it's facts, just look at it. I'm not just pulling this stuff out of nowhere. These are the exact things that have happened in other societies societies before they have collapsed. In the early 20th century, Argentina was one of the richest countries on earth. Just before World War I, the future of Argentina looked bright. Since its promulgation of the 1853 constitution and being blessed with exceptional natural resources such as minerals and fertile lands, Argentina had experienced strong economic growth, which shot it to being one of the richest countries in the world by 1913. Yet this would all go to ruins just a few years later. Going off the economic records, Argentina and struggle with inflation, which is still running rampant to this day, by the way, all started the mid 1940s when the president Juan Domingo Perón rose to power. Perón drew economic inspiration from Mussolini's fascist regime in Italy at the time. And after seeing how Italy done things, he decided to initiate a full transformation of the economy. Now, this change was great if you were a working guy at the time, higher wages, better quality of life and more government benefits. But it also proved to ruin Argentina's economy for nearly a century. You see, Perón empowered unions, erected trade barriers, and shot everyone's wages up as well as increasing welfare payments. And thus people got accustomed to having soft, comfortable lives, which was great for a few years. But by December of 1948, Argentina's gold reserves and foreign exchange value decreased from 1.1 billion to 258 million. And by the end of the year, they'd owe a further 200 million to the United States alone. So at this point, Argentina was sinking and it was sinking fast. So what do you do when the people of a society are enjoying a rich and lavish lifestyle, but the government and its policies are creating a tsunami of debt that is unable to be faced or repaired. First, if you're Peron, you introduce new policies, you print money, and you make some weird changes. At one stage, Argentinians were even required to go two days a week without meat. Peron's policies failed. Growth slowed and inflation skyrocketed because the government kept on printing money to pay for its schemes and solutions. By 1955, Peron was kicked out of office and in seven years had managed to cripple Argentina for the foreseeable future. Argentina's people were forced back into poverty and the economy collapsed. So what does the Argentina situation look like in 2023? Unfortunately, inflation is still destroying the nation and the Argentinian government is so desperate for money, they're taking loans that they can't even afford and they're paying 150% interest per year. And because they would crumble, they would literally cease to exist without these loans, the Argentinian government has to take them. And yet the interest on the loans is sending the country further into a downward spiral. It's a lose lose situation. It's like they're going towards a very, very hard place or a rock. Right now, as I'm filming this video, restaurants in Buenos Aires are changing their prices up to two times per day. Some things that people buy less often like ham are more stable, but the in-demand foods and goods like flour and cookies are changing constantly. And although these people in Argentina are already struggling, guess what happens if they try to take matters into their own hands by buying a more stable currency like the US dollar and trying to hedge inflation on their own personal level. They lose all of their social benefits. The government will literally just kick them out. And yes, you heard me correctly. It is literally illegal to hedge against inflation. I'm pretty sure that they can only buy up to 100 US dollars. And after that, it becomes illegal. This is what most people watching don't realize because they have never gone through anything like this. If the government wants to stop you, they will. And if they can exercise a power over you, they absolutely will. I know this to be true because my parents are immigrants. They came from a communist country. They lived through it and they desperately wanted to escape and come to America. And that's why I was lucky enough to be born here. So I know from all of the stories I've heard from my own parents, I know this to be true. For the people in Argentina, it's already too late. And that's why it's vital for everyone watching to start preparing for the possibility of this happening in America right now before it gets too late for you guys as well. Now listen, 
It's a very extensive topic and I'm leaving out tons of details, but if you want to go and research the Argentina situation even further, I left a link to a documentary I watched in preparation for this video. You can go watch it. It's great. Now, I know they just hired the new president and this guy is absolutely crazy. He's the Donald Trump of Argentina and he promises to remove 70% of the government and like destroy the central bank. I don't know what to say about that. I'm on the edge of my seat waiting to see what he does and hopefully he doesn't kill himself here in the next couple of years. I don't know what to say. And the reason I'm bringing up the situation in Argentina is because this is something that we are going through as well, but at a much bigger and slower scale. We are being led into a new world order. It's happening right now and it's going to happen in our lifetimes. All of the elitist or the people that run the world, you know, the World Economic Forum and all of those people, they know this. And it's not even some sort of secret anymore. It's not even a conspiracy theory. The World economic form has openly talked about the global reset and the new world order and what things are going to look like during the new cycle. This is coming and this is going to happen and you guys need to prepare for it. Now, during this part of the video, I'm going to talk about debt and debt bubbles. At the end of every world order, there is a massive debt bubble. So why do we have a debt bubble at the end of every world order? Well, government overspending happens when politicians spend more money on services for its people than it's bringing in through tax revenue. This creates a debt bubble because they're spending more than they're making. This is also called a fiscal deficit. Right now, as I'm filming this, the fiscal deficit for 2023 is estimated to be about $1.7 trillion. So the government has three primary ways of bringing in or creating new money. You have taxes and fees. You have borrowing money from other countries, from individuals or from corporations, and you have simply creating more money or printing more money. A government will usually raise taxes first, but after they have been raised enough times and the people get sick of it, they'll resort to borrowing from other countries and from its people as it's better than causing inflation by printing money. So how do government borrow from other countries and from its own people and corporations? Well, when a country needs more money because it's spending more than it has, it can sell something called a bond. Think of a bond like an IOU. And when other countries buy these bonds, they're lending money to the country they bought it from. The country that buys the bond promises to pay back the money after a certain amount of time, plus some extra as interest. This helps the country in need of money get the cash it needs to pay for things. Borrowing to cover a fiscal deficit can help finance government overspending, but usually that borrowed amount comes along with interest. Therefore, it's vital for a country to manage their borrowing because as you can imagine, interest can pile up real fast. And if you owe multiple different countries and people a ton of money, a debt bubble will start to form. And that is exactly what we are going through right now. And that is exactly what has been exacerbated by the pandemic. And that is exactly what we are never going to come back from right now in America. And of course, if the borrowing continues and the country just continues to run out of their own money, they can just resort to printing it just like the United States did in 1971. After years and years of America overspending and borrowing and printing, we have positioned ourselves in a $33 trillion debt bubble. And this isn't something that looks very linear when you look at a graph. It looks exponential, which is terrifying. Now, you obviously know that the government overspends. You know how it brings in money and how it borrows from other country and how it can print over money. But the question is now, why does the government overspend and how does the government overspend? Well, governments overspend due to many reasons, but one of them is lobbying, which is when people try to influence the government's decisions for their own personal gain. The very fact that it's legal for powerful people or powerful groups to be able to go into the government and make policy changes and decisions that directly financially benefit them just shows you how corrupt we are. And if you think I'm crazy, I'm going to show you right now that I'm not. The pharmaceutical industry spent over $5 billion in the last 25 years, making it the leading industry for lobbying in the United States. They spent a record $356 million in 2021 alone on lobbying. 
Now, why did they do this, you may ask? Well, of course, it was to influence the government policies on a solution that these companies provided for a problem that was going on at the time. It wasn't a coincidence. Everywhere you turned, people were trying to force a solution down your throat, coming up with any reasons that they could to make you feel bad for not taking this. Now, I'm not saying this to say that you should or shouldn't have gotten a vaccine. That is a personal choice and it's completely up to you. In fact, vaccines can be great and they can be extremely useful, of course. I completely understand that. Now, I'm just making the point that in this specific case, the pharmaceutical industry spent a record amount of money, $356 million in one year alone on lobbying, getting people into the government to change policy to promote and get people to take this thing. That is sketchy. <laughs> and if that doesn't convince you, at the time that I'm filming this video, there are approximately 1,700 lobbyists for Big Pharma right now. Can you guess how many of those people were former government employees or politicians? 59.66 actually, to be exact. How do you think this affects current government policies? Do you think these people are acting in your best interests? Or do you think that they're getting paid and making behaviors in their own best interests? Who do you think the people in office are going to favor? Honestly, I'm not going to give you any sort of answer here. I'm just going to let you decide for yourself. If this isn't enough, just look back 50 years. Do you believe the cigarettes are safe? I believe they have not been proved to be unsafe. Well, in view of the fact that they haven't been proved to be safe, what is the justification that you would offer for spending uh, $3 billion in the last 20 years to promote their use when there's that uncertainty, when we have excess deaths of 200,000 to 300,000 a year, when there's all this evidence which you don't feel is conclusive? What is the reason for promoting its use when it might cause cancer, heart disease, and so forth? Well, I'd have to answer that in this way, Mr. Vince. There are a great many people in the United States and all over the world who enjoy smoking. We think that those people are entitled to the best possible products that we can produce. In the mid 20th century, tobacco companies used their financial resources to influence politicians and public opinion to downplay the risks of smoking while also delaying any type of government reaction, all so that they could sell more. They even launched campaigns targeting young people by offering flavored cigarettes, knowing full well the harm smoking caused. But because of lobbying, the dangers of smoking weren't promoted until decades later. And finally, for those of you in Arizona, our governor, Katie Hobbs, passed 250000 in funding from Arizona Power Service. And my best guess is it's all to try and slow down the solar movement that's been happening here. Those are just a few well-known and common examples, but there are countless others. War, construction, insurance, and many more. But the point is, lobbyists affect government policy big time, and there's no doubt that that contributes to the overspending problem. Because it's in the politicians' best interest to make more money. They'll support their friend slash lobbyist and get some money on the side. All they got to do is make a certain law or policy or change something or delay something. And in return, they'll get slipped a little nice check in the back end through one of their shell corporations or whatever, and everyone will be happy. Now, I also want to be clear. I don't believe what I'm talking about right now is some sort of organized group of elites. I believe that this is the product of human greed. Like humans are, are naturally greedy. And when you give them the option to sit on the board of a company or have major decision-making ability within a company and also government policy, I think they are going to behave in a way that results with them having more financial gain, right? Which definitely contributes to a deficit that they ignore and of course, let their future selves or let the peasant class deal with at the end. Eventually this becomes too big of a problem and it blows up in everyone's face. But who pays the highest price for their negligence? You know who it is? It's people that have literally no idea what's going on and had nothing to do with it this entire time. Now we know that the debt bubble is a sign that the world order is coming to an end. We know how governments make and collect their money. We know partially why governments overspend, why these massive deficits are created, one among many other reasons, but still. And now we have to talk about why all of this overspending inevitably causes inflation and why moderate inflation is better than the alternative, but hyperinflation is the end of the cycle for everyone. Government overspending causes inflation because there's more money in the economy, which isn't balanced by a proportionate increase in the production of goods and services. There's just extra money. So if our productivity remains the same and our demand remains the same, 
and we just print more money for whatever reasons we have because people need money to act in their own best interest, then what happens is on the supply and demand curve, the prices of goods and services just goes up because there is more money in circulation. Now, if people anticipate that government overspending will continue or worsen, they will adjust their expectations. For example, workers will demand higher wages to keep up with the expected future price increases, leading to a self-fulfilling prophecy where prices rise because everyone expects them to. Don't get me wrong though, inflation is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, a small amount of inflation is good so far. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. It's the best thing we've got. The alternatives are deflation or stagnation, which are not good because we're not growing. We're not getting more wealthy. People are more jobless. There's more pain. There's more suffering. Like I said, the alternative is a deflationary economy, which can lead to cycles of reduced spending and job losses. Because when people expect prices to fall further, they postpone spending, slowing down the economy. The key is to have a moderate amount of inflation, which is not the direction that it looks like we're going to be heading in. In the early 1900s, Germany stood as one of the world leading nations, boasting economic strength and industrial power. But the aftermath of World War I burdened Germany with immense war debts, leaving them with huge debt. Now to address these debts, the German government resorted to an approach that by this stage in the video, we all know is a bad idea. They started to print money and they printed a lot of it. This decision set off a chain reaction that led to hyperinflation. The increased printing of money flooded the economy with an excess of cash, rapidly reducing its value. The German mark underwent a rapid devaluation and it was rendered nearly worthless. This situation spiraled out of control with prices doubling every couple of hours. People could barely afford the basics and poverty was the new normal. By 1923, the exchange rate between the dollar and the mark was 1 trillion marks to $1 and a wheelbarrow full of money would not even buy a newspaper. Can you guys believe that? Imagine going to buy a newspaper like a literal wheelbarrow full of cash. That's insane. Life savings became virtually worthless, pushing many individuals and families into financial ruin. The economy had completely collapsed. German had gone from a powerhouse to collapse in a matter of years and gave everyone yet another lesson on why we don't just print more money. This is not a fairy tale. This is real. And this is the direction it seems like America is heading in the near future. Now, the final stage that we're going to talk about is the event horizon. Now, if you know anything about black holes or cosmology, you know that there is this thing in a black hole called the event horizon. Basically, when you pass the event horizon, there's no coming back. If you get close to it, you can still use a ton of energy to escape it but as you pass it, you're done. Not even light can escape. I'm just laying it out straight. The US is not going to pay back this debt. We are well past the event horizon and there is no coming back from this. In the next 10 to 30 years, I think during some point in those times, this is all gonna explode. So what does that look like exactly? Well, from my research, there's only four options that a society has when it can no longer pay its debts and when it gets too big. Number one is they raise taxes and they cut spending. This would result in your hard-earned cash being taxed into oblivion while the government cuts its spending. And this is also known as austerity. This is an attempt by the government to reduce deficits and limit budgets so that the American government can allocate more money to repaying their debts. The problem is these policies also increase your taxes and cause the common man to suffer because of the government's failures. There's probably a reason that Biden just hired 87 thousand new IRS employees recently. I don't know why they hired that many employees, but my guess is to audit 40 million working class average Americans. It's all a giant attempt to close the invisible tax gap and audit more hard earned working Americans so that they can take your money, which is literally only being done because they need the money that bad. Imagine how much money it costs to hire 87,000 new employees. The American government are desperate, and this is the best of a bad bunch when it comes to solutions for our debt crisis. I'm pretty sure the funding for the IRS used to be like $14 billion, and now it's like $80 billion. I don't know. That's something I, I'm saying this right now without researching it, but this is something that I feel like I've heard recently. Option number two is they simply default on their debt. They just, they default, they stop, they stop paying. They say, hey, can't pay, sorry. Think about defaulting like when someone can't pay back what they owe to the bank. Instead of an individual, it's an entire country that can't keep up with its loan payments to other countries and other lenders. Since the country doesn't have enough money or resources to fund its debt, it loses its ability to borrow money, fall down and go belly up pretty much. Remember Argentina? Well, in 2009, 
2001, they could not pay back their debts and they defaulted. Now, because of that default, Argentina had a tough time borrowing more money from other countries, which they needed to maintain living standards and keep themselves afloat. Since they could no longer borrow that money, the economy struggled. Businesses began failing, people lost their jobs, and the Argentinian government couldn't provide the bare essentials like healthcare and education. Prices inevitably also shot up and food, fuel, along with everything else became significantly more expensive. People even lost their savings since the value of money plummeted so much. The everyday working man, the average Joe, the majority of the population was absolutely crushed by the government, their decisions, and their negligence. The people in control, they, they don't care. If you've learned anything in this video so far, I think the major lesson thus far should be people only care about themselves and they will do things that benefit themselves that harm other people in the future. They don't care. All of these problems in Argentina led to protest, civil unrest, and nearly even war to fix all the issues that they had after this default happened. Now, option number three, since defaulting seems crazy, they have the option to just print more money. But in many countries, including the United States, the authority to control the money doesn't lie solely with the government. It's given to an independent organization called the Central Bank, AKA the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve and government are separate because it prevents the government from freely printing money at a whim. Think about it. If the government can print money without any oversight, they would just do it whenever they faced budget deficits or needed funds which if you've been paying attention, you'd know it would ultimately lead to inflation. So by giving the authority to an independent third party central bank, there is some sort of middleman between the government and inflation, which is supposed to protect the reserve currency. Think about it like having a responsible parental guardian in charge of the monetary policy so that the child government can't do anything that they want and mess up and stumble and fall and just break everything and get away with it. Option number four is debt restructuring. Governments can try to negotiate with their lenders to restructure the terms of the debt repayment. Kind of like changing your loan agreement for a car, they can extend the repayment period, they can reduce interest rates or even negotiate that the other country or individual forgives a portion of the debt. Debt restructuring makes the debt more manageable for the government to repay while also keeping in good faith with the creditors or countries who lent them money. If you live in America, we are going to see these things happen. Some of them are already happening, but we are going to see these things happen more severely. And we know that we are near the end when we're basically doing all of these things and we're desperate. Now, what will most most likely happen will be a combination of these four things when we get to the point where we are desperate. Right before I started filming this video, there was another downgrade from a credit agency that happened recently. Two credit agencies have already downgraded the US government's rating, which is kind of insane. Now, if you don't know what credit agencies are, they are organized groups of people that basically determine the rates of a country's financial stability. Your credit card score is a number that helps other other people that are going to lend you money determine how good of a person you are to lend money to and that rating for the US government has dropped. So it's like the government's credit score just dropped. They lowered the US government's rating because of the increasing debt and spending gap, claiming it might not be sustainable for more than 20 years tops. Now again, that number that they give lies somewhere in the range that my opinion was, and I think that's just crazy. They've noticed the growing differences between what the government spends and what it earns, and if people who pick and choose winning governments for a living within credit agencies believe the US has a maximum of 20 years left before financial chaos, what does that say about the state of our country? All right, anyway, enough fear mongering, enough scare tactics. I hope you guys are willing and motivated to prepare and how do we prepare for what is coming what i'm going to do and i'm going to tell you what i think people should do as well based on five categories that you are in financially i want you guys really quickly to all think back to a few years ago when the pandemic happened what happened when everyone found out that this was going to be a huge thing they panicked everyone panicked it was absolute chaos food was wiped off shelves cleaning materials and disinfectants were unable to obtain. You couldn't even buy toilet paper. I remember my mom needed to borrow toilet paper from her sister because she could not buy any. And there was countless numbers of stories about similar things like that. Imagine what would happen if we saw signs of hyperinflation. Imagine what would happen if 
we felt a civil war about to happen in our country, what would happen? Like, what would people do based on history? You might watch this video and think that I'm crazy, but the truth is that if you are watching this video, you have probably never experienced the downfall of a major society in your lifetime. I've done a lot of research on it and I've seen it, but I've never personally lived in a country through its downfall. And the truth is, is that probably everyone watching this video is on the same page as me. And what that means is since you've never lived through it, and since probably 99% of you have not done the research that I have done because I had to do it to make this video, of course you wouldn't expect this to happen. And of course this sounds crazy to you. And of course I sound nuts because nothing like this has ever happened to you. But if it had happened to you, it would be way more believable. And if you fast forward back to 2016, if somebody were to come out and say, hey, this pandemic is gonna happen like the Black Death and everyone's gonna have to be locked inside their own homes and everyone's gonna have to wear masks and it's gonna be crazy, you would probably look at them and be like, yeah, probably not. Like, I know that that's happened in the past, but I've never, it's never happened to me. It's probably not gonna happen. And then boom, it happens. And now if someone says it, you might not be so quick to, disagree with them. I think it's a similar case here. And I think that most of us have never experienced the crumbling of a society. At least we've never lived through it. Like people in Argentina, like people in Germany, like people in whatever have lived through it. And we might live through it relatively soon. The same arrogance that Americans have today, thinking that we're too big to fail is the same thing that the British, Dutch, German, and Argentinian people we're also thinking. I just want to illustrate that. And yet within a matter of years, all of their hopes and dreams, everything changed for them. Everything was different. Now I'm going to finally share how you can prepare to survive through these changing times and thrive through them. Keep in mind that if you are watching this and you are around 20 years old, this will likely happen while you have a family. So you would not want to be caught with your hands tied or your pants down when you have a wife and you have children that are relying on you to survive. If you're watching this and you're a guy or if you're a girl, um, you're going to have a family and you have a right to protect that family. And uh, yeah, this will happen within you and your family's lifetimes. Preparation is key. And in my opinion, and this is very rudimentary, at least five levels that are important to viewers of this channel uh, and people that watch my channel. Um, five levels of financial stability and wealth. Um, and I'm going to kind of explain each of them and what you should do if you're in each of these levels. Now, again, this is my opinion. So, you know, take this with a grain of salt. This is just what I think. So, all right. So level one, at level one, you have less than a thousand dollars in savings. Look, if you are at level one and you have less than a thousand dollars in savings, you should not be super worried about hedging inflation or about investing your money and getting high returns. You need to just worry about earning more money. First things first, if you don't have a job, you need to get out there and find one. At this stage, you are trading your time for money. Just like I did back in the day at Taco Bell, here you are getting paid an hourly wage and there's a little you can do to earn more money apart from working longer hours. Essentially, you have no leverage. You have to trade your time and purely your time for money. But don't worry, just like I escaped this level, you can as well. Here at this level, you should be trying to cut your living expenses as much as possible and spending little so that you can start saving. Live humbly for six months and get a few thousand dollars stacked up so that you have some sort of safety net. And in the meantime, when you're not working, look at starting an online business so that you can start by breaking the link between your time and your earning capacity, just like I did. Now, this is level one. This is where I was at when I was working at the car wash, when I was working at Taco Bell, I just needed to get out there and start making more money and saving more money. All right, so level two. At level two, you are slightly better off. At this level, you have around $10,000 or less in savings. You probably have a job or a consistent source of income, and you probably are pretty decent at managing your expenses and you're not spending more than you're making, you're saving up, you're starting to grow your wealth. Here is the point where you could start moving away from just trading your time for money and you can start learning a high income skill so that you can also trade your knowledge and your intelligence and use your brain to make more money. This would come in the form of starting an online business or having a high paying skill that you can leverage on the internet. 
If you want to learn dropshipping, we have an entire free course. It's just a collection of videos and helpful resources, and it's all for free. You can get it for free. You don't have to put your credit card in or anything. The link to that free course is down in the description. Concrete TikTok dropshipping. This is just one of many businesses you can start online, and you will learn many high income skills if you do succeed at this. And again, we teach it for free. So make sure you go join that after this video is over. At this point, I would still recommend not worrying too much about hedging inflation and investing your money because you simply don't have enough to where it counts. Your priority should be increasing your cash flow, learning more skills, and trying to get more sources of income. Now, at level three, we have a decent income and a savings around $100,000, give or take. Now, I know this was a huge jump, but just try to fit yourself somewhere in one of these levels. Here you have a good job and you are skilled in some areas, but your time is still linked to your earnings most likely. And here's where you start looking for ways to become more skilled and start growing your money exponentially instead of linearly. This is really important. Money is exponential, not linear. And if you get past the initial $100,000, money actually becomes very, very easy to multiply. I've noticed this in my personal life. This is common knowledge. It's well known. It's talked about. Ask anyone that's a millionaire or billionaire. They probably will agree with me. I would say at this point, you need to start getting in the habit of making the money that you have saved up working for you. At this point, you can worry about hedging inflation. And at this point, you can start and really start to invest your money and try to become a great investor. You can also invest that money and start a serious online business that produces another serious income for you alongside your job. If you still have a job or alongside another business, if you are already running one business. At this level, you can get into some low level real estate or you can get into some more risky things like cryptocurrencies, uh, trading those and investing in those as well. I wanna emphasize to not take unnecessary risks at this level because this 100K is extremely, extremely important. It's really hard to make this first 100K and you need to take care of it and be delicate with it so that it can grow. Water it like you would water your garden in its infancy. At this level, I would say you wanna focus on trading your time. I mean, you're always gonna be trading your time for money, but you want to start focusing on trading your skills. Basically, like I said earlier, you want to get your money working for you so that it's growing without you having as much input in it. Okay, so level four, congratulations. You have well over 100K saved up and who knows what it is. Maybe you have 150, 200, quarter million, half a million. At this point, you are in the top one to 5% of people depending on your age. And in my opinion, it's at this point that you can really start to prepare for this debt crisis that we are going to go through. Here you are on par with the people at level three, but you just have way more capital. Maybe you've been doing it longer or maybe you're making way more money. At this point, you wanna focus on mainly trading your money and your skills for money, but on occasion, you are still going to spend your time and trade your time for money, of course. I don't want you guys to get confused. Of course, if you learn about investing and then you invest your money intellectually, you're still trading your time for money because you're you know, spending the time to learn. You guys know what I mean though. When I say time for money, I'm saying like going and clocking in at a job. I also wanna highlight that at this level, things can go wrong and you can get a little bit comfortable with the lifestyle. You can start to buy too many cars like I did. You can make mistakes here and you wanna just be careful and you wanna keep your perspective good and you wanna remember to not create an elevated lifestyle and to still live below your means and to keep growing your wealth and to keep preparing for turbulent times ahead. Lifestyle inflation is a real thing. And believe me, you do not want to be the guy that figures out how to make millions of dollars and has $10,000 saved up. And believe me, I've met some of these people. Now to move forward from here, it's about diversifying your investments and using the diversification to hedge against inflation. At this point, you can buy gold, crypto, stocks, real estate. You can buy other currencies and you can really try to become as steadfast as possible. Inflation doesn't infect all assets equally. Some assets like cash or fixed income investments might lose value due to the decrease in purchasing power. However, real assets like land or commodities often retain value or even increase in value because of their scarcity and value aren't eroded by inflation. Now, at this point of wealth, I would say that if you're living in a heavily densely populated area, like in a downtown city, I would say at this level, it might be a good idea to get out of that city and move more in the suburbs or even further out of the city. Before this level, it's not really relevant because you need to just worry about saving more money. But here is where you might 
want to start moving out of that. Like we talked about in this video, civil unrest and violence is a symptom of this whole thing falling apart. And when that happens, you want to be away from people. You don't want to be in the middle of everything. So if you have the money and if you're diversified and if you're making tons of money and you want to continue to prepare, like if you're hedged for inflation and you want to just be even more prepared, I think this is probably a logical and rational next step is like getting out of a city. At this point, I would also consider having reserves. I would consider having reserve water, uh, reserve food, like food supply, MREs. And I would, uh, if you're a gun owner, I would consider buying reserve ammunition and having reserve guns. Um, just having it as backup in case you ever need it if you can no longer get it in stores. Another thing you wanna would consider getting reserves of is like things that go first when there's panic. Like look back to COVID, uh, people were hoarding food, people were hoarding toilet paper. Toilet paper is a really good one. Um, and water and cleaning supplies, disinfectants. Um, so these are some of the things that you might consider having and building up a reserve of right now so that if something does happen and, and the shelves are wiped out and worst case scenario, they don't come back on the shelves for many weeks or many months, you can find yourself having them if you need them. And to simplify at this level, you wanna invest, you wanna diversify to hedge inflation, you wanna be prepared for inflation uh, and be able to take advantage of inflation by owning real estate, owning commodities, gold, silver, etc. All right, now bonus level, level five. So I would say if you have over $1 million in liquidity, um, you are at level five. Now I know in the grand scheme of things, there's, <laughs> there's way more levels to this, um, but I don't think that it's relevant um, or worth my time to like continue building out these levels. And also like, I don't really know what to do when you get past like $10 million of liquid after taxes. I'm not there. So I don't really know, everything I'm saying in these levels are based on like what I've done at those levels and what I've seen other people doing at those levels as well. So, so far this is like pretty rational stuff that I would say. But like, if, if I had like $20 million liquid, um, I don't know, I don't know what I would do. That's like maybe one person watching my channel has that level of net worth. At this point, I would like to congratulate you because you have achieved financial freedom and time freedom and you are a free soul. You can do pretty much anything that you want to do at this point for now. Now, just like the stage before, you want to do pretty much the same thing. You want to diversify your capital. You want to hedge against inflation. You want to invest in businesses and continue to create high income sources for yourself or continue to grow the, the source of income that you currently have. It is at this stage where you can like actually really fully prepare for like an economic crisis. And obviously, the more money you have, the better you can take advantage of a crisis, right? So at a million dollars cash after taxes, like just liquid straight up in your account, you can really take advantage of a crisis and you can uh, be super prepared and safe when something like this happens. The more money you have, the better you can do what I just said. At this level, you might want to consider buying wealth in other countries. I know th this is such a rich, like rich person problem. Like, oh, I have too much money in one country. I need to buy in other countries, but I'm serious. If forever, for whatever reason, you need to get out of this country, for whatever reason, if you can't get access to your bank accounts, if they shut off the internet, if something just happens and you can't access your wealth, it would be smart at this level, if you have this much money, to start buying wealth and storing wealth in other countries. For example, I have wealth in Switzerland. I currently have gold in Switzerland that I am able to access if I fly to Switzerland. It doesn't have to be Switzerland, it can be Canada, it can be Turkey. You can store wealth wherever you think is a safe place for you to store that wealth. But it's just like like stupid things like this that you might want to do if you have like this amount of money. Another thing that you can do is have multiple passports. This is something that I'm doing, of course. So yeah, multiple passports. And if you want to look into why, go do some research. I'm not going to explain it right now. And also at this point, I think that you can also invest into a property that's fully self-sustaining. This is something that I'm currently working on. It's a project. It's a long project, but I am going to build my own self-sustaining property. Um, basically, I'll have my own water. I'll have my own septic and plumbing, and I'll have my own energy through a solar panel farm. So I will be completely self-sustainable, which means if the entire electricity grid failed and went out and didn't come back online, 
I wouldn't even notice. I would just still be doing the same thing unless I turned on the news. If there was no water in the stores, I wouldn't notice. If there was no food in the stores, it wouldn't matter because I have farm and I can grow my own food and I have a reserve of seeds and whatever else. Like these are the things you can start doing when you have this amount of money or like a few million dollars liquid. But yeah, this is just like another taking it to the next level. I think the next level for me is building a runway and buying a plane that can land and take off that runway and a plane that can travel to a second property overseas. <laughs> so that would be like the level above the level that I'm talking about right now, but I haven't gotten there yet, guys. Anyway, at this point, if you're gonna be building this like self-sustaining home base or like survival base uh, in order to just stay there during these really turbulent times, you would want this to be far out of the city, right? So like not in the suburbs, like far, far out because it's self-sustaining. So you don't need to be in the city for any reason. And you want to be as far away from the mass population as possible, because if everyone starts killing each other, you don't want to be in the middle of that. So that's my opinion. This will ensure that even if a civil war breaks out, you will be decently prepared. I mean, compared to others, very, very and extremely well prepared um, for this situation. And you will be able to endure this period of time without a lot of suffering, which unfortunately, a lot of other people are not going to be able to say they can do. At this point, I would say you are mostly safe, like almost mostly and completely safe. And of course there's levels to this, like there's, it gets way crazier, I'm sure. Not only are you gonna be able to avoid all of the civil unrest and internal conflict, but you'll also have the resources and funds necessary to hedge against inflation and also take advantage of inflation. And if something crazy happens, like there's a huge bust or a huge crash, you'll have enough capital to be able to buy things. And, um, you know, even if your cash is worth something, you have gold. Even if your gold is going down, you have land. Even if your land is whatever happens, like you're diversified, you can take advantage. Like you are just set. You're in a good spot. Now, I do briefly want to say that I'm hosting a challenge called Ecom Odyssey, where I'm giving away $110,000 to 123 different winners. Now, I don't have time to talk about all the details on this video, but I left a link to the landing page of that challenge, and you can go learn how to enter that challenge and how to participate and potentially win $500 every single week or win up to 10, 15, or even $25,000. So guys, please go check out that challenge. It's lasting three months. It's a 90 day challenge. So even when this video goes live, you know, it's still going to be live for a decent amount of time. And I really want to provide opportunities that were never provided to me when I was starting my online business. And doing this challenge is one way that I can do that where I also make money. So it's a win-win, it's really great, and you don't have to pay anything to get started. So don't get confused by that. But if you want more details on how to win or how to participate in a prize pool of $110,000, it's very easy to win money. Please go and check it out. Like I said, it's free to join. It took me so long to set up. I worked so hard on it and I want you guys to win some money. So please go down there and join this challenge. Now to conclude, we are living in a turning point in history. As they say, history doesn't repeat itself but it sure does rhyme. Most of what I shared with you today is based on research and facts. Most of the examples are real and they happened in real life. And these things will happen again. I just want you guys to be as prepared as you possibly can when it does happen. I'm personally doing some of the things that I've been mentioning in this video to prepare for this. And I hope that you guys learn something and I hope that you guys start preparing for it as well. For the people that put time and effort and work very hard in preparation for this next world order, those people are going to prosper and they're going to greatly benefit from their preparation. But for many, and it sucks to say this, it will be a period of hardship and suffering. I genuinely care about the people that support me and watch my videos. And that's why I have spent so much time making this video. I've spent so much money on research and hiring people to help me with this video. And it's been recording for almost two hours now. I'm almost out of breath talking, but you guys on YouTube have helped me so much and you have propelled me on my journey and you have given me wealth and I want to help. I want to give it back. And this is what I believe is going to happen. I just want to give it back. I want to do my part for you guys. I genuinely care about seeing all of you guys on the right side of history. I hope that you guys benefit from it. I hope you guys prepare from it. Yeah, guys, so that's all I got for today. I'll see you next time.